Desh, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks very much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me for this talk. And uh, as expected, I think post prandially normally the, is, the crowd is uh, normally thin, and it's extremely thin. And um, um, now this, it is very interesting session as the chairperson was saying uh, it is important that you see the other side of the table what we try to do and uh, in terms of diabetes management I think uh, you do get opinion for okay getting a cataract surgery or retinal surgery something done get the sugar under control but I think the challenge is uh, not only uh, getting the sugar under control it is just the getting the patient adhere to the treatment and also a lot of other challenges of controlling blood pressure and other things I'll just go uh, in a brief way it is about eight minutes talk so I'll try to stick it to the time so what are the complications of diabetes so diabetes is not a mild disease uh, you can see uh, it leads to microvascular and macrovascular complications both uh, a stroke and heart disease and uh, uh, in terms of di diabetic nephropathy neuropathy and also uh, eye disease as well so the micro and macrovascular the eye kidneys and neuropathy have you got any pointer no Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, eye, kidney, neuropathy, and extremities, and heart. So, micro and macrovascular, if you can uh, uh, just imagine the volume. It is a vascular disease. And uh, in terms of data, UKPDS, for example, is the uh, almost like a gift study we had. Uh, when you try to diagnose somebody with a diabetes, this is the um, amount of disease they already got 21% with retinopathy, neuropathy and erectile dysfunction and neuropathy already got the patient had it. Now you know about diabetes thing uh, as in the pathology wise you know about insulin secretion deficiency, insulin resistance these are the things that normally people know but I think it has changed in uh, currently uh, I'll come to the next slide which will explain uh, in a big way so along with that that hepatic glucose output and also uh, this is the main thing when Defranso presented in 2009 in ADA there was about 15,000 people and uh, almost he had a standing ovation for three minutes so this is the work he's done throughout his life um, if you look at it, this diabetes mechanism has changed in a big way with impaired insulin secretion, incretin uh, defect, lipolysis and also neurotransmitter dysfunction. So it is not a simple disease, it is a complex disease uh, as in terms of mechanism itself. You leave alone the environmental factors and uh, genetic factors and all polygenic uh, etiology but apart from that the mechanism itself it is so complex. So uh, just for the intro, you see uh, the, uh, the prevalence is very high and it's most uh, uh, common cause of blindness and glaucomas, cataracts and other disorders are the ones which you know better. And uh, the preventive uh, is the way forward. Uh, it is very essential to screen uh, the people with diabetes and uh, prompt referral to ophthalmologist. Um, uh, I'll come to that what do the guidelines say how when to refer and what we practically can do in our centers so uh, it, subsequent and frequent examination is very very essential as a general practitioner or a physician or an endocrinologist or a diabetes treating person um, that uh, we have to do come to the uh, at least think that we should refer uh, and get people screened annually so these are the factors that normally affects the uh, diabetes retinopathy management. The one is hyperglycemia, hypertension, lipids, anemia, obstructive sleep apnea, smoking and then obesity as well. There are quite a lot of systemic factors that is involved. So I would just go for a, a glycemia first because that is the one that is the in front of your eyes and that is what we try to do. As I said the mechanism is changed in a big way. So what is new in diabetes because our uh, kids and uh, the population is going bigger and bigger. Um, so the old days of thinking okay you got insulin secretion defect from pancreas and that's it you don't have anything else is gone. I think there are a lot of mechanisms. You just imagine I got a nine-year-old uh, type 2 diabetic going to school and having uh, food from KFC three times a week. 
you know so the kids are all getting plumpier and plumpier the fat cells is a hormone secreting cells and it talks to the brain and gut in a big way there is a, a gut to brain signals and the fat cells pancreas gut and brain talks and then hormone production for example leptin adiponectin you have to know a bit of it because the treatment also varies as i said the kids are getting very very big and insulin resistance you can see in the neck the insulin resistance is getting worse and worse and we are dealing with the new generation of diabetics if you say if if you know what i'm saying i think a new generation of diabetic lying in a thin individual of our ranchesters who worked a lot in the sun and not working and getting diabetes is different with these kids we are going into a, a, a really a multiple thing now the treatments also varies and uh, this is the gila monster from uh, pacific and uh, uh, there is a, a, a molecule that is taken out from there and that molecule is being used it's called the gut to brain signal uh, is being treated uh, if you know the mechanism i showed one of the mechanisms the diminished incretin effect incretin is nothing but a gut hormone so we give that as a treatment and get the weight reduced along with the diabetes control why i'm covering this one is i think it is very important for you to know the all the injections are not insulin so don't think when patients comes with your ophthalmology department with in injection it is not insulin altogether it used to be bieta and victosa but now we got a new weekly ones uh, glp ones and gliptins is in the market you should know about it um, that is uh, citagliptin saxagliptin wildagliptin lenagliptin tenagliptin alogliptin uh, omariglyptin there is quite a lot of gliptins there and sglt2 which is also very important for you to know because it can cause uh, almost uh, uh, diuretic effect and is called a serum glucose 2 transporter system uh, inhibitor so that means that it will send the sugar through the kidney out therefore therefore the blood sugar is controlled and modern insulin analogs insulin pump delivery system so the glycemic control is very very important intensive glycemic control we got lot of weapons than what used to be because of the mechanism is changed so you see with the data as i show that conventional intensive it shows clearly the progression of retinopathy is diminished and uh, with the data as i show uh, as i mentioned about uk pds but the dcct is the gold standard one in type 1 diabetics both studies showed when the reduction of a1c is there there is a significant uh, reduction of uh, progression of diabetic retinopathy and uh, people think okay i controlled the blood sugar now that should be a good uh, improvement in retinopathy it may not be all possible all the time actually so good glycemic control doesn't guarantee retinopathy control however i think the multifactorial one as i mentioned about diabetes and glycemia we discussed now and then the next aspect is about the blood pressure control it has to be intensive even to one month ago there is new guidelines has come up with 140 90 has been the target has been reduced to 130 80 with people with diabetes and now the data for lipid also is there with phenofibrate field study uh, that means that controlling the cholesterol but it hasn't got much of evidence to show it uh, reduces the progression of retinopathy so there are numerous drugs have been tried for uh, 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 microvascular prevention but it doesn't work so i think the primary thing is to control the blood sugar blood pressure and cholesterol um, but I, I i'll come back to the screening aspect uh, with the guidelines as i mentioned ada guidelines for the type ones within five years of diagnosis and then uh, annually if you got problem two years once if you don't have retinopathy and same thing applies to type 2 on the day of diagnosis i try to send people for retinopathy screening um, but if you don't have a problem again two yearly once but pregnant women um, england we had a guidelines with each trust has got a different guidelines but in that nine months i think it's more sensible to do a monthly screening uh, if we can because the glycemic control in pregnancy second or tri sec third trimester the the uh, retinopathy can go worse so it shows that strict glycemic control and blood pressure control as i mentioned but not lipid control in a big way as showed prevention or progression of retinopathy so what i would do or when to refer uh, patients for screening um, as i mentioned um, uh, in that uh, uh, table box before the type 1 and type 2 
uh, if they don't have problem two yearly ones but however i think just to maintain the compliance in our country i am doing every month uh, sorry every year referral and i stick to the birthday of a patient i say to them just go on your birthday just for a eye checkup that just keep them in uh, in brain you can all of also follow that um, barriers to earlier screening in our country especially fear of discovering something bad i i've just went through the the stall initially and i saw that there is a screen system but a lot of people will be worried uh, to go for a screening so that is my summary just optimize the glycemic control manage all the other risk factors and physicians should get educated and teamwork is needed so in my view I think screening is very essential glycemic control I've showed you the new mechanism and the current uh, treatment available other risk factor control appropriate referral teamwork and patient cooperation so the diet is very important opening a stall at five o'clock and people just sitting at three o'clock um, and then um, the exercise wise I think this is December 31st and January 2nd the hall is empty the gym is empty and this lady was asked to do a gym um, she was told asked to go for a gym and then use a treadmill she is doing both with the chair there so and I would say teamwork is very very essential and that is the teamwork needed I mean, it is a multidisciplinary teamwork and patient attitude is important this is the last slide so if you attack our single soldier we declare war against your country if you attack us we will take your country out of the map and if you attack us we pay stop cricket playing cricket with you this is the attitude of the patient thank you very much uh, thank you very much dr suresh uh, before we move on to the next talk i think uh, because you are the most important speaker as far as uh, an ophthalmologist goes for today's session for us couple of questions and comments from you uh, i'd like to highlight and uh, uh, get your opinion as well we normally get patients uh, who have uh, vision loss as well as fair amount of uncontrolled diabetes uh, systemic status what is your cutoff when you say okay go ahead or is there any cutoff you feel is not necessary simultaneous treatment can be done this treatment will be in form of either laser or some injections into the eye what we call as intravitreal injections see um, that is the challenge in our country I don't know people traveling far from I don't know the you know the geography here people come from Uti or Erode or uh, uh, all the rural areas and if they come for a treatment here they come with the blood sugar of 300 in front of you and you say okay go and get it control and come back now now the challenge is if they go back I can't monitor home glucose monitoring or anything like that in a village where they go in so what I try to do is not for everybody not for everybody but just try to get them admitted for one day or 48 hours and then I say that okay just your sugar is under control now I can see with the home glucose monitoring with almost like six times a day um, then if you get a two days of reading in 48 hours the glycemia is stable and A1C is very reasonable of eight or nine he had hyperglycemia because of uh, various reasons that he went into recently uh, then that is the ideal candidate to go into surgery or the procedure as you mentioned but people have got poor compliance and everything it is going to be real challenging and if you can't admit them then you have to get it done and somewhere blood sugar around 100 to 180 I'm comfortable with but but given that they are high risk to get infections uh, you have to be very strict sometimes saying from your area saying no and I also say no because it is like India people just go in the back route and say okay can you get me signed off I mean it's not like a school seat or anything it is just uh, uh, eyes that can get infected so uh, I am very strict about getting the control between 100 180 maximum so usually you know whenever you know we talk to the physicians and uh, whenever we have these kind of discussion as you just rightly pointed out that I am comfortable with the patients having HbA1c 8 and 9 which is a you know kind of practice that we do it's a myth for us we always say you know if we see 8 and 9 we say you should be 7 but we know when we interact with the physicians in a really close contact they say don't stress on the 7 you are going to damage his heart so that's what you know so the thing is repeatedly stressing sometimes you know stressing upon the seven and below seven I just wanted a quick comment on that 
actually that is a very good point i think you are trying to point out an accord style accord trial is the one which but that, that showed the intensive glycemia doesn't do any benefit it can do some harm that is intensive so below 6.5 on 6 there is a potential of hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia can trigger into a lot of uh, other autonomic and uh, multiple uh, 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 triggers so that can lead to complication but they didn't still find out the mechanism of Hakkot trial uh, but coming below 7 and everything that is a bit uh, strange because that is what we are aiming for and uh, we know from a lot of data even UKPDS, VDA, VADT, uh, DCCT and uh, even uh, Accord, everything showed that bringing the blood sugar control will uh, reap benefits in terms of micro and macrovascular complications in a big way. So below 7 is, yes, below 6.5 is sometimes too strict and it entirely depends on the patients. And also with the new group of drugs which doesn't cause hypoglycemia in a big way, I think we should go ahead and get a strict control and then give it to you rather than just having okay-ish blood sugar. Another comment uh, we need is, uh, you have mentioned that onset less than five years or, you know, approximate onset of five years or so, uh, then you normally start a referral. But normally what happens is, in, especially in Indian scenario, we are really not sure about the diabetes a patient has. It's just as one uh, random check somewhere in some camp or some, you know. So what is your uh, take home message on that? Like how you ideally select a patient for a immediate referral there as compared to a slightly different referral? That is a very good question as well. But I just mentioned about five years for only type 1s. For example, a kid who has been diagnosed for four year or five year old, then I think you can wait within that five years, you can get a referral done for an ophthalmologist. For type 2, on the day in a camp or whatever we are finding, already they got a chance of 20 to 25 percent of microvascular disease. So you need to go ahead and just do a referral. I, I, that is my way of doing, immediate referral. Any other questions, Ashish? Okay. With this, we move on to the next talk uh, on uh, OCT as well as intravital pharmacotherapy.